Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jonathan Savage and in the early hours of Sunday the 8th of May, these are our main stories. The Taliban orders women in Afghanistan to wear a full face veil in public. For the first time, the Northern Ireland election is won by a party which wants a united Ireland and Ukraine says all women, children and the elderly have been evacuated from the besieged steelworks in Mariupol. Also in this podcast, from prison perhaps to power, Brazil's former president confirms he's running again and... Hey, do you see that? Look, right up there, that's the start line. OK, let's go! But should a six-year-old really be running marathons? The Taliban authorities in Afghanistan have announced they will force women to wear the full face veil in public, returning the country to the dress code enforced during their previous time in power more than two decades ago. If women fail to comply, their so-called male guardians will be punished. It's another blow to women's rights. The Taliban have already greatly restricted access to employment, travel and education. The spokesman for the Ministry of Vice and Virtue is Akif Muhajir. Our correspondent in Kabul, Sekunder Kermani, asked him to justify this latest decree. The mechanism that we announced today is clear. 99% of Afghan women already wear the hijab. For the other 1% of women, we're simply requesting that they do the same. This is not our government request. It's an order from God. We're saying that Muslim women cannot be without a hijab because it needs to be part of their lifestyle. Once this comes in, they will then have to wear a full hijab, as Sharia law says. It's not just 1%. In rural areas, yes, many women already wear the burqa, but in Afghan cities, in Kabul, in Mazai Sharif, most women just wear the, the head covering. Surely this is not respecting their rights to choose how they dress, how they interpret Islam. We're not saying that the burqa is the only option. As we said today at the meeting, the burqa is a hijab, but also the Arabic hijab. That's also part of our society now. And we also said that a large scarf can also be a hijab too. The black burqa is not the only option. There are different types of hijab. Some of the speakers here have said that this is advice. It's not being enforced. But anyone who doesn't comply, their relatives could go to jail, could go to court. It is being forced. This is compulsory. It's an order from God. So we have to take action if people don't comply. And just to clarify, we're talking about the full face veil here, right? That's what your understanding of hijab is. Not just covering the hair, but covering the whole face, just revealing the eyes. Yes, I mean, it should cover the whole face. And again, these are not our words. They're explained in Islam. The wife of the Prophet Muhammad, the mother of all Muslims, she said, we went to the Hajj pilgrimage, and when the men appeared, we would cover our faces. And when they left, we would remove the covers. So that means, in Islam, face coverings are compulsory. There will be some women in Afghanistan who feel... This is no longer their country because they're not able to choose how they dress themselves. What do you say to them? No, that's that's not right. Afghan women are very different from other women in the world. They're special. They feel comfortable and secure with a hijab. Women who don't wear a hijab in our society, they're not thought of as good people. In Afghanistan, I don't think anyone will leave because of our order today. Taliban spokesman Akif Mohajir. Paul Henley spoke to Fozia Kufi, the first female deputy speaker of Afghanistan's parliament, who has personally been involved in negotiations with the Taliban, even after making her own escape from Afghanistan. The sad reality is that while 35 million people in Afghanistan, or more than that, are at age of starvation, Taliban priorities seem to be only women's clothing and the way they dress. They need to focus on allowing girls to go to school, which have been stopped now for more than eight months, and letting women to go to work because in no other Muslim countries, 
women are deprived of work or education or political or public life, political participation in Afghanistan, that is the case. So instead of making those policies for people, for women and uh, and general public to have a a different life, to have access to economic resources, to have access to health facilities. They just focus on back-to-back issuing decree, limiting women's public life as a means of pressure. They want to deprive women from, you know, progress by enforcing them to wear what they want to. And they think that way they can actually deprive women and Taliban continue to do so. And just a bit of detail on what they are forcing women to wear. Describe it. They have said that, you know, the burqa, which is a traditional kind of clothing of hijab and not an Islamic hijab, the woman appearance should be fully covered. And if they do not do so, they will be advised first time. And second time, they will be punished. After punishing, they don't comply with what the Taliban's uh, definition of hijab is. Their male members of the family will be punished, which is uh, in contradiction to any law, including the principles of Islam, because... In Islam, it says your face and your hands should be appeared. You only have to cover your head and your you know, body. But the Taliban prioritizing and focusing on a burqa, it is a traditional choice. And people have always made the choice to wear burqa or not wear burqa. For me, the mentality of Taliban is an issue. You sound outraged by this directive, perhaps not surprised, though. I am surprised because I was in the negotiation with them and they seem to have claimed that they are not going to do the same policies and pursue the same policies that they had been doing from their, the time that they were in power first time. We have been trying in the negotiation to explain to them, to try to make them understand on how the society in Afghanistan has changed. Those traditions that the Taliban have claimed under the name of religion have now changed. Fazia Kufi speaking to Paul Henley. Sinn Féin's leader in Northern Ireland, Michelle O'Neill, has declared that her party's victory in provincial assembly elections ushers in a new era of politics. She's poised to become the first minister in the Stormont Parliament. The Democratic Unionists have warned that they may not rejoin the power-sharing executive. Emma Vardy reports from Belfast. Sinn Féin's historic victory means they are now the largest party in the Stormont Assembly and that the Democratic Unionists have lost the position they've held for 19 years. Sinn Féin's Vice President Michelle O'Neill said the result marked a new milestone. Today represents a very significant moment of change. It's a defining moment for our politics and for our people. Today ushers in a new era, which I believe presents us all with an opportunity to reimagine relationships in this society on the basis of fairness, on the basis of equality and on the basis of social justice. Never before has an Irish nationalist taken the position of Stormont First Minister. But for Michelle O'Neill to be installed in the job, the DUP would have to agree to go back into a power-sharing executive. The party has said it'll block the formation of a devolved government unless the Brexit trade border with the rest of the UK is removed. The DUP's leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, said his stance on this had not changed. We will accept the outcome of the election. However, our position remains that we need to remove the long shadow of the protocol uh, that is uh, inhibiting our ability to operate and function properly um, within the political institutions. And the sooner that happens, the sooner we'll be in a position to move forward. Sinn Féin won the largest number of first preference votes by quite some margin. But now the parties will enter a period of negotiation about power sharing. And if there's no agreement after six months, in theory, a new election may have to be called. Emma Vardy. Our Ireland correspondent Chris Page has been considering the nationalist movement's growth as a political force. Irish Republicans see themselves as the political descendants of rebels who fought for Ireland to be independent of Britain. Since most of the island left the UK in 1921, the movement has focused on ending partition. During the conflict in Northern Ireland, Sinn Féin insisted that could only happen through the use of violence, and the party was regarded as the political wing of the IRA. Sinn Féin was led for more than three decades by Gerry Adams. This is a generation of men and women who have fought the British for the last 25 years and who are on defeated by the British. Republicans saw the potential to achieve their aims by political means in the early 1980s. An IRA prisoner, Bobby Sands, was elected as an MP. 
He and 11 other paramilitaries died on a hunger strike. Sinn Féin began pursuing electoral success, and that helped to deliver an IRA ceasefire in 1994. The party's move from guns to government was completed in 2007, when it went into power-sharing at Stormont with the Democratic Unionist Party. Gerry Adams' successor as leader, Mary Lou MacDonald, has taken Sinn Féin to new electoral heights on both sides of the Irish border. It still has a number of politicians who were in the IRA, but they are becoming fewer as time passes. Now Sinn Féin is set to replace the DUP as the largest party in Northern Ireland, which it ultimately wants to merge with another state. Polls also suggest Sinn Féin is on course to win a general election in the Republic of Ireland in the next few years. Chris Page. The Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol has been under siege from Russian forces for weeks, with civilians holed up alongside Ukrainian fighters. Ukraine says that an operation to rescue the civilians trapped there has now been completed and that all women, children and the elderly have been taken to safety. Here's Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. I want to thank the teams from the International Committee of the Red Cross and the United Nations who've helped us to complete the first stage of the mission to evacuate Azovstal. We've managed to save more than 300 people, women and children. We've brought the civilians out of the plant and we're now preparing for the second stage to evacuate the wounded and medics. Of course, if everyone fulfills the agreements, if there are no lies. Of course, we're also working to evacuate our military, all the heroes who are defending Mariupol. This is extremely difficult, but it is important. Our correspondent, Laura Bicker, who's in the city of Zaporizhia, gave me an update. So the first news came from the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine. She said that all women and children had got out of the Azovstal steel plant. It was then the Russian Defence Ministry also said that all civilians had been evacuated from the plant. Now, it hasn't been confirmed by the United Nations or the Red Cross as yet. Now, I know that they would like to wait because these are delicate and complex operations and they want to wait until the civilians are on a bus and safely on their way to Zaporizhia before they declare this operation a success. And only then will they believe it is a success. What I do understand also is that there are still 2,000, around 2,000 Ukrainian fighters, including 500 wounded servicemen, still inside that plant. I've spoken to the families of some of these servicemen. They have pleaded, they have begged with world leaders to get involved and to try to negotiate their release. But the question that we're all asking ourselves is, what is Russia going to do now? Now that the civilians are outside the plant, what are they going to do? We have seen over the last few days that shelling has continued. Certainly we've seen pictures and there have been various reports, including from the British Defence Ministry, that the shelling has continued despite promises of a ceasefire. And there's no doubt that capturing the whole of that port, the whole of the port city of Mariupol, would be hugely symbolic for Vladimir Putin ahead of May the 9th uh, Victory Day celebrations. You mentioned how it's been such a delicate and complex operation, incredibly sensitive. How did they actually go about getting the people out of the plant over a period of days and weeks? Well, I've spoken to the UN coordinator who was on the ground with the last operation that got 101 people out of the plant. And he said when he got there, there were mines, the area had to be demined. And then he said his team faced mortar fire. He didn't know from which side it came. He said, but that also delayed the operation. He said that then he had to persuade those inside these tunnels. Now, remember, this is one of the biggest steelworks in the world. There are mazes and mazes of tunnels underneath. So, first of all, they had to locate where these civilians were, and then they had to persuade them to come out. Remember, they've been underground for more than two months. They've not seen any news. The only thing they know is they've been bombarded by Russian shells every day. Uh, And so they didn't know that it was safe to come out. They didn't know if they could trust that it was safe to come out. So it was then trying to make sure that they felt safe enough to come out and then onto the buses. But certainly the latest operation we saw on social media that Ukrainian fighters put on there, that they used white flags to signal to the Russian forces that civilians were on their way and that Russian forces signalled back. Now, that would imply some degree of cooperation between the two sides um, to get these civilians out. Laura Bicker. 
Before the Russian invasion, the Ukrainian city of Oman was a place of pilgrimage for thousands of Orthodox Jews. But now many of the local Jewish community have left the country. Those that remain are offering help to displaced people of all faiths and none who are fleeing the fighting elsewhere in Ukraine. And for some older Jews, today's conflict has stirred up unbearable memories. Caroline Davies reports from Uman. Morning prayers at the grave of Rabbi Nachman. The city of Uman is known around the world as a place of pilgrimage for Orthodox Jews. Every Rosh Hashanah, thousands fill the city. But many in the small community that live here year-round have fled, escaping Russia's aggression. The synagogue has become a welcome centre, distributing food to whoever needs it, regardless of religion. Roads from Dnipro, Kiev and Odessa lead to Oman. Many evacuees have passed through here on their way out of the country. We decided to give them here a place to sleep, the hotel and the medical centre. Rabbi Nathan Ben-Nur is the president of the Rabbi Nachman Foundation. Oh, it's not good, yeah, but... We must to make from the lemon lemonade, you know. I'm down in the basement of the synagogue. This is normally where people would come for mikvah, ceremonial washing, but now it's been turned into a bunker. There are mattresses piled up on the floor because up to 200 people would shelter down here, sometimes spending the night. Uh, it was usually staying from 50 to 200 people. Erina Rybnitskaya is part of the team that helps run the synagogue. For sure, I can say you that Hasidim community and Ukrainians became more closer because Hasidim people taking care of uh, Ukrainians, they not, don't differentiate it. Jewish people, not Jewish, it doesn't matter. Infuriated Germans executed men, women and children. Systematic massacring of tens of thousands of Jews and people hiding to avoid deportation to Germany as slave labour. The last time war reached Uman, it was the Nazi occupation. Just a few miles from where they were born, three Holocaust survivors remember the horrors of their childhood. Yevgen tells us that he narrowly escaped from a basement when Nazi soldiers attempted to gas him with exhaust fumes. Dmitro's family lived in the forest to escape Nazi troops. Half his family died of tuberculosis, unable to buy penicillin. Olga was only two when the soldiers arrived in her village. They took us five kilometres to a field. I was with my mum and my granny. There were ditches dug. Then the soldiers began to shoot. They started in the morning and it went on until midday. Then they sprinkled a little earth and left. Two boys survived and dug me out with their hands. I was hidden by a family until the war ended. All three are angry at President Putin, justifying his involvement in Ukraine as denazifying the country. Dmitro tells me that he has many relatives in Russia. They start saying to me that we have a lot of Nazis, and I tell them that if that's true, that I'm also a Nazi. You can kill me too, he says. Over 80 years on, others are relying on the kindness of strangers. The Yeremets family escaped from Russian-occupied Kherson two weeks ago. They're just one family of over 100, hosted by the Jewish community in a hotel for free. I'm almost 70, says Grandfather Victor, but I've never seen anything like this in my life. They just said, here's everything you need. We did not expect this. As long as I live, I'll be so grateful to these people, says his daughter Ina. The family don't know how long they'll call this hotel home. For now, a small moment of calm in this place of pilgrimage, now become a place of refuge. That report by Caroline Davies. Still to come, shaped like a torpedo, the colour of bronze and very, very hard to find, scientists in California track down a true treasure of the deep. Brazil will go to the polls in October to elect a president amid rocketing living costs and growing fears of authoritarianism in Latin America's largest democracy. The right-wing incumbent Jair Bolsonaro is likely to face the two-time former president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who until four months ago was in jail on corruption charges and banned from holding elected office. Today, the 76-year-old announced his candidacy with a hard-hitting speech attacking his right-wing rival. 
We need to return to a place where no one ever dares to defy democracy again. We need to send fascism back to the sewer of history where it should have stayed all along. So how will Lula pitch his policies? A question for our reporter in Brazil, Daniel Gallas. Brazil's had rough patch with COVID and with global recession, inflation and all these sorts of things. So Lula's main pitch is basically to get Brazil back on track. During his term in from 2002 to 2010, Brazil had really astonishing growth rates and a very prosperous economy. So he's, he's trying to play a bit on nostalgia and promising voters that Brazil can get back on track like it was when he was back when he was president uh, more than 10 years ago. From prison to the presidency, once again, he hopes it would be an astonishing political comeback. It already is, arguably. Um, is it fair to call uh, Lula charismatic but tarnished? I, I think it's a fair it's a fair way to characterise him. And it, you're right, it's one of the most astonishing political comebacks we've seen, I don't know, in, in modern times. If you look back four years ago, uh, Lula was in jail, accused of corruption, uh, sentenced, And now, four years later, he regained his political rights. He managed to discredit all the court decisions that were ruled against him. Uh, There was a big revision of his corruption case. So it it is quite astonishing that all all of this uh, happened in such a short period of time. But he is a free man running and he is leading the polls right now. And the man he will be probably up against is uh, President Jair Bolsonaro. How popular is he at the moment? President Bolsonaro remains a very popular figure, but the polls suggest that he's trailing Lula. We're still more than six months away from the election, so that means that anything could change. And President Bolsonaro has very strong supporters as well. Although Brazilians will vote, the electoral system that Brazil has, uh, only two candidates go to a runoff vote, and it's very likely that Lula and Bolsonaro will be the ones making to that round. But this is very dis- a very divisive, controversial election, and uh, this is not a, a normal situation where two opponents are simply battling for the hearts and minds of the electorate. Uh, these are actually two politicians that hate each other, and things could escalate in, uh, in a very big way, and there's a lot of tension between Bolsonaro and Lula at the moment. Daniel Gallas. Emmanuel Macron has been sworn in for his second term as president of France. In a ceremony at the Elysee Palace in Paris, he promised to invent a new style of government for his second mandate. Hugh Schofield reports. In the Republican monarchy that is the French system of government, this was the equivalent of the coronation, though with the same man bequeathing and inheriting the symbols and powers of office. Newly re-elected, Emmanuel Macron received again the golden chain of the Grand Master of the Legion of Honour, then, in a short speech, promised a new beginning for this second term. Le temps qui s'ouvre sera celui d'une action résolue pour la France et pour l'Europe. The approaching period is a defining one for France and for Europe. Firstly, to avoid any escalation following the Russian aggression in Ukraine, to promote democracy and have the courage to see it through, and to build a new European peace and a new autonomy on our continent. Last month's election gave him a clear and historic victory, but it also exposed the rifts at the heart of French society and the growing strength of the forces of far right and left. With parliamentary elections now a few weeks away in which he needs to secure a working majority, President Macron promised a new social and ecological contract with the French people and to make France a stronger and more independent nation. Hugh Schofield. A couple from Kentucky in the US are facing criticism after they allowed their six-year-old son to run a full-length marathon in Ohio last weekend. The Crawfords, who post on YouTube under their username Fight For Together, are regulars on the racetrack and have previously competed in many marathons and other physically demanding challenges with their six children. Our reporter Harry Bly has been following the story. I tried time running. Why do you want to do a marathon? Cammy and Ben Crawford and their six children, who range in age from 6 to 20 years old, post regular videos to their almost 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. The Crawfords are known for setting themselves challenges, often physically enduring. 
In 2018, they attracted scrutiny after their vlogs showed them hiking parts of the Appalachian Trail during a snowstorm. They're all keen runners too, and have completed several marathons. That's the start line. That's where we begin. OK, let's go. Let's run to the <laughs> All right, well, we can walk there. We'll be running a lot. Believe me. I'm so excited. That's a clip from a video of a half marathon that the family, including their six-year-old son Rainier, ran three weeks ago as part of training for the full marathon at the centre of this controversy. On Sunday, the family ran the Flying Pig Marathon in Cincinnati in the state of Ohio, a distance of just over 42 kilometres. And it's because Rainier ran the race that the parents are facing a backlash. How do you feel about running? Good. In particular, it was their Instagram post, which in the caption mentioned that six-year-old Rainier was struggling physically and wanted to take a break and sit every three minutes, and that the parents, Cammie and Ben, had promised their son potato chips if he kept moving after having run for seven hours. Among the online criticism, the most notable scorn came from Cara Goucher, a two-time Olympic long-distance runner, who said, A six-year-old cannot fathom what a marathon will do to them physically. A six-year-old who is struggling physically does not realise they have the right to stop and should. In response to the outcry, the parents posted a statement to their family's Facebook page saying they had never forced any of their children to run a marathon and that six-year-old Rainier had been begging to join the rest of the family in taking part. The organisers of the Flying Pig Marathon said an exemption had been made to allow the younger children to take part, which is normally for 18-year-olds and over. Its president said from now on that age limit would be strictly enforced. Harry Bly. US marine scientists have spotted a rare dragonfish swimming in Monterey Bay in California. The scientists said they'd only seen the fish four times in nearly 30 years of deep sea research and they'd managed to capture it on video. Sunita Nahar reports. The scientists said they'd been trying to track the elusive Bathophilus flamingi, also known as the high fin dragonfish, for decades. So imagine their excitement when they noticed it lurking at a depth of nearly 300 metres in Monterey Bay. There's hardly any sunlight down there and the scientists from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute had to shine a light from a remotely operated vehicle to film the fish. The predator looks like a shimmering metallic bronze torpedo and roams the depths of the ocean for prey. Scientists believe this bronze shade probably acts as camouflage so that the fish becomes nearly invisible against the dark background. This dragonfish has a set of sharp teeth. It can grow to over 16 centimetres in length and has long, thin rays for fins which can detect vibrations in the water and alert the fish of any predator or prey that's on its way. Bruce Robinson, a senior scientist who was part of the team that captured the fish on camera, said that when they shone their light on the fish, it looked just gorgeous. A rare fish in her own right, Sunita Nahar. And that's all from us for now, but there will be a new edition of the Global News Podcast later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics we've covered, you can send us an email. The address, as usual, is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. This edition was mixed by Johnny Hall and the producer was Judy Frankel. The editor is Karen Martin. I'm Jonathan Savage. Until next time, goodbye.